You know, I think we get more comments on that music for that minute stream before we start than anything else we do. Patricia's in the house. Good morning, Patricia from Stafford, Texas. Where are you watching us from this morning? Hey, it's growing bolder now. I'm Bill Schaefer, and we're, did you hear my chair there? It does that once every time, and it won't, it won't make that big noise again the whole time. Interesting stuff. Anyway, this is Growing Boulder Now. I'm Bill Schaefer. We're glad to have you with us. In just a moment, we've got a pretty fascinating interview coming up, something we really all should be curious about. We're going to talk with a guy who was a college professor who had a midlife crisis. Anybody out there have a midlife crisis? Well, he didn't buy a Corvette, he didn't get a Morgan Fairchild tattoo, and he didn't get fitted for a toupee or do any of the other things that I would do. Instead, he became a restaurateur and an author with a certain goal in mind. He wants us to improve our diets without even realizing it. His name is Ari Pulapaka, and he will tell us why he believes we all can improve our health. We can all eat a plant-based diet, and we can all like it at the same time, Hari Pulapaka is a great guy. So that's coming up in just a minute. Other comment from Patricia who says, good morning, Bill. So good to see you. Ah, that's great. Be a part of this community. Be a part of our stream here. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitch. And uh, we're on YouTube. So leave comments as we go and, and uh, say hi so we can say hi back. Find out where everybody's from and help build this community. This is a... Um, it's a pretty big weekend, right? We're sitting on the cusp of a three-day weekend. What a great feeling that is. It's, it's awesome. You know, we really didn't have much of a 4th of July last year, did we? I, I don't even really remember what I did. Don't know if you remember what it was like for you, too. What are you thinking this time around, though? What are you going to do? Go ahead and answer that right now in the comments. What are your plans for the 4th of July? I think we'd all be interested to see where our collective frames of mind are this time around. Are you, um, are you going away for the weekend? Are you flying? Are you driving? Are you going to stick close to home? Maybe just hang out with family and friends? How about fireworks this year? Are you going to a fireworks show? Let us know what you're doing. You know, I think... Uh, I think my wife and I are invited to a friend's for dinner, and she said something, too, about seeing a Tom Petty tribute band somewhere also, so that might be kind of fun. It, it, it's it, Hey, there's Russ. Russ is in the house, too. He says that uh, diet is everything. 90%, 99% of prescriptions wouldn't be needed if we ate better. That's a great point, Russ. Russ, what are you doing uh, over the 4th of July weekend? Maybe we can uh, get together someplace along that as well. Um, Russ is a great guy. He's always got really interesting things going. Patricia is expecting lots of rain this weekend. You know, there's a tropical storm heading towards the coast of Florida. That's probably not going to be here till the beginning of next week, says Growing Boulder's Amy Sweezy. But we do need to keep an eye on that. Sandra Kate here from New York as well. So we're talking about 4th of July plans. And I was mentioning there's a Tom Petty tribute band somewhere. And just saying that... How long has it been since we've all had choices? I think we'd all be curious to see what you've got in mind. So go ahead and, and let us know over there in the comments. So how was your week? Hope it went okay. It was a great week in the world of Growing Boulder. Why? What made it so great? Well, first of all, we have this brand new broadcast television program. It's called What's Next? And it's kind of like, pardon the interruption, meets TMZ. What we do in the show is we bring up a variety of topics, some short videos, and then the, the, the real secret sauce, the magic for me, is our panel of Growing Boulder personalities offer their takes, their insights, and impressions, and it is excellent. There are, there are some great conversations. There are unexpected moments, and, and it's all centered around these topics you just don't hear people talk about. Topics that matter to us all. It's called What's Next. What's Next makes its debut in the Orlando area tomorrow on WESH TV. And it's airing all across the state of Florida. Where and when? Well, all you have to do to find out is go to growingbolder.com slash what's hyphen next. You see it right there on the screen. And not only will you see a full broadcast schedule when you click on that link, it's a gorgeous page. You'll find bios on all of our hosts, including da 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 da. But wait, there's more. At this, I love to say that. 
But wait, there's more. At this link, you'll also be able to view the very first episode. You can watch it right there of what's next in its entirety. And I'd be really curious to see what you think because I think you'll like the feel, I think you'll like the topics, and I really think you'll like the conversation on what's next. That's growingbolder.com slash what's hyphen next. Make sure you give that a look. Also, something else big in the Growing Boulder world, the Growing Boulder app is out. And you really need to see what we're working on and what we've created here. This is this has got a, such a remarkable way for you to check out all the great shows, the, the videos, the interviews, and more that are available on Growing Boulder. And, and the cool thing about this app is that it kind of presents it in a Netflix style presentation. There's topics and you scroll through them and pick the ones you want and you can do it for free. See what it looks like by going to growingbolder.com slash TV. You can check it out, you can learn more about it and I'm telling you it is slick and it is very, very cool. See what's new on Growing Boulder at growingbolder.com slash TV. Meet Sim9 is commenting on uh, Twitch. What up, chat? Good to see people popping in on Twitch. We're really working hard to develop a, a presence on that platform. It's really cool. I don't know if you Facebookers have been over there, vice versa, checking each other out, but it's very different, very interesting, very dynamic, and we've had some great things. Um, not only did we have another great week across social media, period, and not only are we here with you on Growing Boulder now, we really are doing fascinating things on Twitch. But what we did yesterday, and I don't know, Meet Sim 9, were you there yesterday uh, on Twitch? Man, it was off the charts cool. Mark Middleton invited two giants of music from two completely different generations to join him. Well, I need a little bit of this. How are you, you guys have your coffee with you this morning? This is cool. One of the guitarists and lead vocalist for the heavy metal band Trivium. He was one of the guys there. His name is Matt Hafey. He's amazing. He's an extremely talented player who's an extremely curious guy, good guy, smart guy. And Mark got him in the same virtual room with a legend, a rock and roll hall of famer, Roger McGuinn of the Birds. And it was spectacular. You want to see how some of that went? You want a quick look right now? Of course you do. So let's take a look at what happened when Matt Hafey from the metal band Trivium meets Roger McGuinn from the Birds. You're turning 79 this year. Uh, does, that, does that scare you? Uh, it seems to me you don't worry about it. You've embraced every year and take it as it comes. Are, are you excited for what's ahead? What do you think about your next decade? Not really. Uh, too scary, but it's a little daunting. I always thought 80 was pretty old, you know. <laughs> Man, Matt, what, what do, how does that affect you? Does that inspire you to hear that? I mean, Roger, you look amazing, man. So it's, yeah, I think once you stop being active, once you stop being you is when things start to fall apart. As long as you keep doing what you do, just like you, like we were both talking about uh, 30 minutes ago, talking about how music is in us. It's what we do. We don't stop doing this thing. And I think the fact that we do that, the fact that Mark three times a week is up there four or five in the morning swimming laps, it's like, it's once we stop is when things feel bad. You know, you've, you, you've been there and done that. Uh, Matt is certainly not, not a, a 22 year old anymore, but, but he's in a different stage of his career than you are. Uh, if you could give him any advice at all about either longevity in the music business or the, how you find your thing and hang on to that thing. I mean, what, what, what have been your biggest frustrations, problems, or, or advice that you could give him? Perseverance. That's it. Uh, I remember one time I was in touch with a, a guy at one of the labels and I was out of a record deal at the point and I said, you know, like a record deal, he said, hey Rod, you know, some some people, you know, it's like it's like jocks, they, they know when to hang it up and uh, <laughs> I think it's your time. And Camilla said, my wife, said, well, even if we have to stand on the corner with an open guitar box, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep playing. So it's perseverance. That's awesome. That's awesome. Man, he is right about that. That is awesome. And it was fascinating on so many different levels. So many differences, yeah, and still so many things in common between these two stars from two different generations, Matt Hafey and Roger McGuinn. 
And Patricia Bishop says the comment that she got out of that was, I think the best thing about music is that anyone can enjoy it at any age. And that's true. I mean, you get these two guys together from completely different ends of the spectrum and they find common ground through the music. And it really is a unifier for all of us. You know, the thought is, is that, well, we like our music and they like theirs, but when you share, when you collaborate, really cool things can happen. You know, you can watch that entire stream on Twitch. I don't know if you've ever checked Twitch out, but there is a lot there, and the Growing Boulder page is dynamic, to say the least. So all you have to do is go to twitch.tv slash Growing Boulder. Once you're there, be sure to click on the Follow button and click that you want alerts, and then you get a notification when Growing Boulder is going live. So watch the Roger McGuinn, Matt Hafey, Mark Middleton thing. It was really, really good. Great things from Growing Boulder on Twitch. But now it's time for our big interview, so here we go. I'm Bill Schaefer, and this is Growing Boulder. You know, it used to be that food was just food. Remember? I mean, whatever was around is what you ate. Then we started eating for taste. The better something tasted, at least in my case, the more we'd shovel it in, until we started realizing we were eating ourselves sick. We started to understand that the right food could be essential to our health, to our longevity. Plant-based was something everybody was talking about, but oh my gosh, I mean, who wants to learn a whole new way of eating? And that can be so bland and so tasteless. Well, now we know it doesn't have to be that way at all. In fact, with a little knowledge and a little creativity, a vegetarian diet can not only be the best thing you could possibly do for your health, it can also be the tastiest. That's what our next guest believes, and he's offering to prove it to anyone who will give him a chance. He's a restaurateur, a chef, and the author of a book called Dreaming in Spice, A Sinfully Vegetarian Odyssey. Let's say hi to Hari Pulupaka. How are you, Hari? I'm great, Bill. Thank you for that rousing introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today. But isn't that true? Isn't that the way it is? We kind of all go through this process of eating until we realize that it is the key to everything we are. It is. You are what you eat is an old saying. And I grew up a vegetarian in India, in Mumbai, and I came to this country over 21 years ago. But as a professional chef, of course, I've cooked and served just about everything there is to do. Uh, I am of the firm belief that Food, as you point out, not only uh, is sustenance, but it's nourishment, it's enjoy, it's enjoyment, it's memory making, it's longevity, it's love, it's the key to the the our very own the sustainability of our very own species. It's everything. I mean, food brings people together in ways that you very well know. Uh, I can't think of uh, any significant event that didn't have a component that related to food and or beverage that made the, the experience even more enjoyable. So I truly believe that a plant forward diet, you know, it's a hard ask sometimes for people to just sort of give up things that they're so used to and enjoy so much. So I'm of the firm belief that by asking gently, but proving without any, uh, any, self, uh, so any, any, any doubt that uh, the food that's on the plate is First of all, tasty. That's my. That's why I, I lean on that. That's how I begin the conversation of food. Food has to taste good, and I'd like to think that my experience with that comes into play a little bit. My own background, of course, but food when it tastes good, is just that. It's enjoy. It's 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 fulfillment. It's enjoyment. It's nourishment. But when that food that tastes good is also good for you, how could it not be a win-win situation? That's really my mo, frankly, in life. Well, Hari, I, I did not realize that you were raised in Mumbai, so let me apologize to you because you missed out on a youth filled with Twinkies, corn dogs, <laughs> cotton candy, sugary breakfast cereals, all the wonderful things that our parents gave us in our formative and growing years yes, so yes. that we would all grow up to have diabetes, obesity, and heart conditions. Well, I, I, I see what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, but I don't see the result of what you perhaps did as a youngster because you look great, my friend. But, you know, India, is like any other country, has its share of junk food and fast food and food that tastes good and is not good for you. It's not always grounded in sugars necessarily, but we do have our share of 
carbohydrate forward, fat forward. Ghee is a, like an Indian creation, apparently. Clarified butter, but it's not. But it's apparently used a lot in street food when the street food is of a certain quality. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I would be the last person to subscribe a shift in one's diet that gives up enjoyment. And so you're allowed to miss. You're allowed to kind of... I don't want to say cheat, but allow to treat yourself in a way that satisfies your soul and and sort of completes your memory of life with your, your your memories with food. But it's all about balance, is it not? It's about you know you can you can you can play if you work a little bit, right? I mean that's really what it's all about. So if we're willing to work a little bit towards being more mindful with what we eat and how we eat and how much we eat, uh, then we're allowed to play a little bit. And playing sometimes involves a nice tall basket of french fries in my opinion nothing wrong with that well, you, you got something there because really i think more than anything we're kind of creatures of habit change kind of scares us or knocks us off our, our axis anyway no matter what kind of change it is and growing up with the diets that we had i mean uh, th does it seem to you that like vet the vegetarian diet's kind of like the rodney danger field <laughs> of diets i mean it gets no respect no respect, no respect at respect. all <laughs> well, why is that? Why, we, we really are. You say a vegetarian, and, and that terrifies people. So you make a great point, and that's the challenge. It's the uphill battle that I and people like me face when I'm trying to educate and sort of inspire people to live life differently with the food that they eat. Uh, you know, words matter, right? You point out words matter, and it gets no respect. Vegetarian. So all of a sudden, when we label food a certain way, but having said that, you know, we have a need to label food. I mean, we have to tell people what kind of food it is. But, you know, it's all about packaging. It's marketing to some degree. In India, people don't necessarily label everything that's vegetarian as being vegetarian because it's a much old, older tradition of eating plant-forward meals. Uh, and nor do people say this is a chicken dish necessarily. It's a dish. Here's the dish and here's the maybe the historical context and here's the flavor profile. After that, you can discover for yourself to some degree what the main ingredients might be. So in my opinion, the term vegetarian, at least in the West, in the American West, I should say, more so than Europe perhaps, um, has, has been deemed as just that. It's a label, not unlike uh, being uh, a hippie or being a Democrat or being a libertarian or any of the label you want. So I think it's a matter of just us as professionals, I speak for myself now and my colleagues in the industry, uh, to just put out damn good food and don't necessarily label it as being vegetarian. It happens to be. That's the good news. But it tastes good first, and that's the first story. That's the lead story, to use your metaphor. Folks, Ari Pulapaka is with us making great points, and the biggest point he's made so far is words matter. It makes a difference. And Hari wrote a book, a great book, one you should check out, called Sinfully Vegetarian Odyssey. If words matter, my friend, what does sinfully an odyssey have to do with vegetarian? Great, great question. You know, I had I thought long and hard about what would I call this book that clearly was going to be mostly plant-based, but certainly vegetarian. First of all, it was easy because it's the life I lived and it's what I ate for over 21 years exclusively. So it's not like it was a stretch for me to think about food that uh, was made up of ingredients like that. The sinfully referred to the, refers to the fact that you're not doing it. OK, I can get a lot of flack, but it's in fact, I've been encouraged to say change the title, to, to be completely, the, completely honest with you by some professionals and some experts to maybe change the title. I stuck to my guns. I left it as the way it is. But to me, the reason for the word sinful or sinfully in this case has to do with the notion that I just mentioned a while ago, which is that I lead with some sort of some semblance of decadence and enjoyment. You know, we often think of sinful desserts as being just that. It's a sort of a, a, a maybe I don't deserve this. It's too much. I'm probably committing a crime of some kind by eating food that tastes so good. And that's the reference there is to, to eat is to is to be inspired by what's in the book and my thoughts about eating sinfully, but eating vegetarian food in a way that satisfies your cravings. And there's a certain sort of uh, a reference to maybe we, we sometimes uh, fault ourselves and maybe and experience some sort of guilt when we feel good, right? So that's, there's that. The Odyssey clearly refers to my own journey.
my journey uh, as an individual, as, as a human being first. Uh, but in the context of this book, my journey as having of having lived an exclusively vegetarian lifestyle, not knowing any different because that's how my family ate uh, growing up. And so for 21 years, that's how I ate. I came to this country in 1987. Long story short, now serve all kinds of food there is, but I'm sort of making a full circle back. And maybe that's the lesson here. My journey is coming full circle to what I truly believe when it comes to food and what what role food should have uh, in the world we live in, which is that it must taste good and it should be as much as possible good for you. So it's sinful that it's enjoy, it's enjoy, uh, it's it's full of joy and it tastes good and it's um, an odyssey. So it's a complete journey. And that's probably that's probably not uncommon for most of us when we reach past a certain age, we think about okay, what is it what really matters at this point in your life? And for me, what matters now is to sort of bring to the table, pun intended, all that I've learned, what all that I think is important but along the way, continually, continually learn and improve and grow bolder. No, I like what you did there. And, and that's a great answer. I, do, do you get the feeling though, I'm sure you run up against this all the time. We, man, if you come out with, if you would have invented a supplement that would have maybe given us more vegetable content and less of something, oh, we'd, we'd be jumping to grab it. We, you, you couldn't stop us from coming towards you. But you know, there, there are generations of us here, I think, who have been, like I said before, we've been raised on fast food and soda. And to many of us, if cooking, if it involves more than a couple minutes in the microwave, well, you know, we got other things to do. So how do we change our mindset? And how can we get your kind of cuisine to be incorporated into part of our daily routine? Thank you for asking that. I mean, that's the point. I'm a teacher first. And so, you know, I, through my experience, of course, know a lot more than I'm able to teach sometimes. And that's true about most of us as professionals. So for me, the secret there is to, first of all, start with baby steps. And that's a cliche, I know. But, you know, you can actually use a microwave and taste really, make really tasty meals. I'm not suggesting that we do that necessarily all day long. But the recipes that are in the book, first of all, range from being very elementary to very complicated and very professional. And that's intentional because I want the book to be as, as useful and enjoyed by a wide spectrum of society. So for those of us who want to not necess necessarily spend two hours in the kitchen, even though for me that's nothing, but to spend two hours in the kitchen to make a meal or just a dish even sometimes, you know, by spending a little bit of time up front, doing a little bit of Sunday prep, if you will, or any holiday prep, you know, while you're making your normal meal to make a few condiments and flavoring agents and spice blends and sauces, which I give a lot of recipes for in the leading part of the book in the recipe section, I'm suggesting that when it's time to actually make a weekday meal and you're tired and you don't want to spend even 20 minutes making a meal, you spend some time on your day when you do enjoy cooking, when you can't knock back a beverage, when you can you watch your TV, you can watch your TV program and your sports, and 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 say to yourself, look, I can just reach into my refrigerator, grab something that I made using wholesome plant-based ingredients for the most part, has full of flavor. And with just a little bit of effort in a matter of five or 10 minutes, create a fantastic, deep flavored, foodie style uh, dish or set of dishes that taste like something that I ate at a fine restaurant. So that's the work that kind of has to go. And I would try to inspire po folks to do that. So the baby steps are, you know, learn to make a few spice blends and sauces that really are very versatile and they, cr they, cross, the, they cross all the boundaries of of cuisines that are defined in very specific ways. So you can make a sauce that leads its way to a Middle Eastern dish, it leads its way to a North African dish, and it could lead itself to a Latin dish, all because there are some core ingredients, there's some core depth of flavor, and the application may change, but, but the fact that you've got this one sauce that can be stretched in different ways gives a lot of kind of uh, power to the home cook to say that I can do this and it's not so intimidating and I don't have to buy this product on the shelf in a grocery store that has a laundry list of ingredients. I hope that made sense. It, it does, and this is excellent. And, and I wanna take two seconds and talk to the audience for just a minute. There's a reason that we reached out to Hari Pulapaka. You, you, go, you, know, you know this, it's not the first time you've heard that, yeah, if you change your diet to more of a vegetarian or plant-based, it would be better for you. You've heard this a million times. You've gone into the bookstore, you've seen a million 
vegetarian vegan cookbooks out there. You, you know they're there, but you haven't picked them up or you have and it just didn't connect with you. What we like about Hari Pulapaka is that sometimes what it takes is not just a chef or a restaurateur guy. Sometimes it takes a great teacher and he's that guy. His background is totally unique because he already had a great career as a college professor. So he's really taken a left turn to follow his passion, which is helping all of us become more aware that to be healthier, to be vegan, to be vegetarian doesn't mean giving the stuff up that you love. It means replacing it with other things we love. So, so Ahari, has being a, a teacher in the past, has this helped your natural inclination to to want to spread the word? Thank you for that, Bill. Absolutely. Being a teacher you know, has, is critical for me as I, as I go through life as a human being, because I think by being a professional teacher, I'd like to think I'm a very good student of life. You know, it's hard to be a good teacher or teacher at all if you're not able to learn yourself. And so by practicing the craft of teaching, which I, of course, inherited from my mother, by the way, FYI, my mom got her second COVID vaccine. She lives in Mumbai. She's going to be 90 this year. She got her vaccine just yesterday, her second COVID vaccine. I can't help but plug that in. But uh, she was a lifelong math and science teacher in high school, and she taught me. And so here I am, you know, I came to this country for that reason, to grow my education. But by being a teacher, I naturally first try to learn something as best as I can learn it first before I even have any inclination to try to share that with others. So I have a natural sense of curiosity on my own because I'm a teacher first. And that was extremely useful for me as I went through a professional midlife crisis, you know, over 15 years ago. And I point out, left my, not didn't leave, but just sort of added to my full existence as a full-time academic and went to culinary school at night and all of that stuff. But by being a teacher, I, I, I became better at learning. And by becoming better at learning, I'm hoping that I became better at knowing. And then by becoming better at knowing and by being careful and being passionate about sharing that knowing with others, the world around me as best as I can, I'm hopeful that translates to a more useful uh, talking head uh, for the people out there. So I hope that made sense. Oh my gosh, this is this is so much more than than we even expected. I I love your perspective, and uh, I know you didn't expect this, but I want to ask you more about the midlife crisis. I mean, it's something that all of us go through as we make the turn into what has previously been thought of as the sliding off the slope years, but you've managed to do what growing bolder is all about, and you're turning your midlife crisis into maybe riding the train, putting yourself on the track that you should have been on, where your passion is. You've reinvented yourself. You're, you've become the person that I'm guessing you always wanted to be. How did that affect you? And what do you think of, of this phase of life that you're in? Thank you for that. I mean, I, I, I reflect on that frequently, actually, because I'm asked the question quite a bit as to why and why did you go down this path? Why did you leave your comfort zone and become so uncomfortable and struggle so much to do what you're doing now? And I am sort of old school when it comes to thinking like that. I'm a firm believer of, I have no formal proof of this, even though I'm, I'm a mathematician. I've bought into this idea of life that everything happens, not necessarily for a reason, but we can take everything that happens for the most part and try to make something of it. And so for me, all, those, all that time that I spent studying and getting a PhD in mathematics and struggling, trying to get a, a job here and a job there and bouncing back and forth between temporary positions before I finally landed in Deland, Florida at Stetson University over 21 years ago, uh, I felt like it. all of those experiences are cumulative. They kind of add, they don't take away. I don't think any experience really takes away from a person's overall sense of knowing and, and moving forward and being more bold in decision making moving forward. So I feel like even though I've changed my, I, add, I didn't change, I added to my professional career at the age of 41, uh, 40 actually, I'm 55 now, uh, I was only able to do that 
because I went through everything I did before. So I don't think it was in lieu of, I don't think any of that stuff before was missed opportunity or that I found my calling too late in life. I really don't believe things like that. I feel like I'm in the now and this is what I have and this is what I'm able to do and this is my support system. So it's my responsibility to make the most of it and continue to grow. I hope that's uh, reasonable in mindset. Yeah, I'm curious, I, I, I guarantee that everyone you told about when you were thinking of making this change told you, oh, are you kidding? Authors don't make money anymore. Restaurateurs, that's the worst. You'll be hot <laughs> one minute and cold the next. Are you crazy? This is the wrong move. I don't mind you reinventing yourself, but the direction, you, you want to help people become vegetarian? Good luck to you, because uh, it's not going to happen. But yet, this is a purpose that you believe in. And you said not, it doesn't need to be a calling, but it's it's certainly a passion. So you're 55. What's life like at 55? Well, uh, there are a few things that I can't do anymore, and they're mostly physical. But there's I don't think there's much that I cannot do mentally. I do have, you know, I don't remember everything I, I could at once. Uh, my calculation speeds are a little bit slower than before. I'm a mathematician, of course. So life at 55 for me, first of all, is I feel it's very blessed. I have a wonderful partner in life, my wife, Dr. Jennifer Polapaka. And, you know, you mentioned about people not being particularly helpful or supportive when I was thinking about these crazy ideas of adding on a new profession to my already full-time profession. And Jennifer was, of course, extremely supportive. And, uh, you know, together we built this restaurant and ran it for all this time. Uh, successfully, I'd like to think. But that's important. So what I would say to people is, you know, uh, recognize the folks in your life who are genuinely trying to be supportive. They may sometimes give you the harsh truth and tell you things that you don't want to hear. But as long as you understand that they're coming from a place of true love and true care, take their advice seriously and listen and learn. So in my case, all those folks who told me not to do what I was about to do, which is get into the restaurant business or be an author and try to make money that way, uh, I felt like, first of all, uh, they weren't living my life. They hadn't gained the experience that I had. They were not going through the my my trouble and my sort of, uh, uneasiness with where I was in my professional life. So it's easy to cast aspersions, you know, when 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 it's not your life. And so I feel like you take that advice, you don't disregard it, you don't discount it, you don't always listen to it, but for sure let it inspire you to do what you really want to do. So my advice would be to simply uh, not necessarily block it all off, but rather listen, learn, get inspired. Don't don't kind of be mired in the trenches. Don't don't uh, brood over the negative. Those are all easy things to say, and I can't say this enough. That it's easy to get down. It's easy to self doubt. It's easy to all do all those things. In fact, I'm just now launching a new career of my own again. I'm I'm trying to grow my company, the the Global Cooking School which hopefully brings together on one common track that's wide enough to accommodate both of my professions that is teaching and cooking in a way that makes sense. So it's not so disparate before for all this time for over a decade, 12 years, I was running on parallel tracks. My teaching was going, teaching of mathematics was going almost as fast as my cooking professionally was going and my, my, my wanting to grow my chef personality and career. But I feel like finally at the age of 55, uh, those two tracks are merging, and it, everything that I see ahead of me is making all the sense in the world, frankly. Well, you know, it, it's, it's really not a surprise, and, and I think every single person who's listening or, or watching us, you'll get this, that for even the best chef, one ingredient can make all the difference in the world. And if that one ingredient in your life is your passion or your purpose or something that you really believe in that, that really makes you want to get up in the morning, you've got to add that ingredient to your life. Whether you're 55 or whether you're 85, it's never too late to step in and make a difference. So Hari, let me ask you just a couple of questions to wrap up here for everybody now who's kind of on the edge of their seats and thinking, well, maybe this guy's got something for me. Uh, how, where, do, where do we start? Is, is it with your book? Is it how we, is, is it a different way of shopping at the store? What's a good way to start that's not overwhelming? Certainly. And that's a great point because baby steps that I referred to earlier are all where it's all about. You know, nothing's going to happen if something doesn't change. Let's start with that premise. 
if something doesn't change, if at least one thing doesn't change, nothing's going to happen. Things will be as they are. So a, a small baby step could be just, it could be as simple as one meal a week. One meal a week, as much as you are dreading it, don't consume anything but plant-based stuff. It could be a salad, but there are so many more interesting things out there. It could be a pasta dish. It could be a pizza. It could be whatever. So don't deprive yourself and feel like you have to eat the healthiest thing in the world and you're going to hate it because you can't wait to have that big steak the next day. So start with one meal a week. We all have these things that meatless, you know, that, that, that are kind of national movements, meatless Mondays, things like that. I'm not necessarily promoting that Monday be the only day where you do this. Find a day of the week. It could change during the week where you make one change, one meal. One meal is plant-based. So stay away from the fast Stay away from the processed food aisle in the grocery store. If you have to go down that aisle, don't go down that aisle more than once a week. When you go to a restaurant, and let's say you do have a burger, don't have fries with the burger. Or if you have fries, don't have a burger, right? So make some small adjustments. Replace what would have been a composed, decadent, animal-forward, non-plant-based forward meal. Replace one or two components in that meal with something that is plant-based. And in the process, what happens is, first of all, you're getting a taste of dishes and ingredients that normally you wouldn't even make give much time to. But your body is going to thank you for this. Fold in some exercise, fold in some activity in your life. Maybe it's walking three times a week with the person you love or by yourself or with your dog or whatever. It could be walking for five minutes, walking for 15 minutes. So you add a little bit of exercise and activity, take away one or two things that you enjoy a lot. That, that Of all the things you enjoy, replace them with one or two things that are for sure plant-based and healthy and less in oil, maybe no oil even no sugar, low in salt. And here's the beauty. Here's the, here's the amazing thing. Because the other part of the meal is traditional and satisfying and all of that, first of all, you won't notice the difference. Secondly, I think, and this is the crazy academic in me, the contrast between this rich, decadent, fatty, salty food that you may enjoy a lot of, contrasted again this, against this fresh, unseasoned, natural, clean, light accompaniment might actually make it a more interesting combination. And this is how I think of as a, as a chef. If I make a rich dish, I'm always going to garnish it or accompany it with something that's light and vibrant and fresh. And that's not because I'm trying to provide a healthy alternative, because I think that makes culinary sense. So there's a long answer to your question, but small baby steps, one meal, one day of the week, a little bit of activity, and you'll be amazed how the next week your body's going to crave it. And after a few weeks, your body won't even know the difference. And at some point, that'll be the only way you'll do life. You're, you're, you hit the nail on the head. The definition of, of change, it doesn't have to be an overnight drastic change. It's just something more than you did the day before, whether it's exercise or the way you eat. So let's wrap it up. We're talking with the crazy academic. Uh, <laughs> we'll give you the chance to give us your very best pitch. What what do you hope, if there's one thing that people remember from, from all that we've been through today, what's your message? What do you wish we understood? I would say if I had to pick one thing, I would say uh, don't let labels scare you. Uh, food brings people together. There are over 9 billion people on this planet. They've all been cooking food for different amounts of time, and different societies have evolved around food and inspired by food. Um, don't judge a society by its food. Embrace the melting pot that is the United States of America. Uh, if you do eat a taco, lighten it up a little bit. So the one thing I would say is be open to life. Soak it all in. Listen to your body. At the end of the day, the underscore is listen to your body. Your body is not lying. If there's one entity in this world that's not lying to you, it's your own body and your body will tell you and Hari that's great advice because mine keeps getting bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger but it won't because I'm going to get the book dreaming in spice a sinfully vegetarian odyssey I really can't wait to dive into it I've been wanting to move that direction 
for a long time myself. And, and sometimes all it takes is the smallest push. And the realization is that it's not an ordeal, it's an opportunity. So our guest has been the acclaimed author, restaurateur, and chef, Hari Pulapaka. Great information, folks. Go out there and live your healthiest life. So what did you think about Hari? I mean, didn't it sound like he really had that growing bolder message down? I mean, everything he said was so interesting and so on board. I love what he said about, about us kind of going overboard with labels, because we do that all the time. You don't have to sign a contract anywhere to be a vegetarian or vegan or, or anything else. Just think of it as trying different things. There's no obligation to do it all the time, to do it a certain day of the week to follow any rules or anything like that. It's like what I was saying earlier, one of our guests once told me that as people, we tend to either, you know, we go all in or nothing at all. When really, it's, you know, it's like, like with exercise, we hear this a lot. You don't go out right away and run a marathon. The best definition of exercise is simply doing something more than you did the day before. And the same thing can apply to diet less meat, more veggies, less processed food, more natural foods. And if you keep this moving forward, you can't lose. There, there's no pressure. And that's when real change is more likely to take place. Loved, loved getting to hear from Hari Pulapaka and your comments were fantastic too. Some are more coming in. Um, you know, everybody's kind, of, everybody's kind of curious about plant-based. Everybody's excited about it. It, it. it is different. Any change is hard. For me, the biggest, um, the, the, the biggest deterrent is I think you have to learn to shop totally differently. And who wants to spend any more time in the store than we do, right? Isn't that what you do? You go in, you pretty much know what you need. You know where it is. You know how much to get, you know, so it doesn't spoil or how much you're going to use. But if you're talking about plant-based... I mean, you got to cook it pretty quick. I mean, you got to know how to prepare it. You got to know the ins and outs of it. Sometimes it takes a little while. There's a little learning curve. But with his book and the recipes and the advice that's out there, I think we can all do, do better than we can. Great comments from Jess Hainberry, from Russ, from Suzanne Wilkinson, uh, Debbie LaMotta. Uh, there, there's some great people that, that follow us here, and we so appreciate that. Um, that each week that you guys are in to see what we're doing on growing, growing what? Th this cup? Oh, yeah, I, I know it's pretty cool. Yes, you can get one at growingbolder.com. Just go check it out. There's all kinds of swag and merch as well. The other side, oh, it says this is what Growing Boulder looks like. Cool stuff out there. Do check it out, especially over your long weekend. So I guess that's going to do it for GB Now for this week. And as always, man, we are glad to have you with us. And just want to remind you that the party never ends at growingbolder.com. And whatever you're up to this weekend, try to make a difference in somebody else's life because that's Growing Boulder. I'm Bill Schaefer. We'll see you next time.